I'm going to do a quick bombing through the nearest neighbor's algorithm in this little pre-video. The nearest neighbor's algorithm is another standard dis, uh, algorithm for classification that is pretty easy to understand. There's not much theoretical basis here, and yet it is surprisingly powerful. It also has some pretty clever computational aspects to it. So, Let's dive in. Here's the idea of nearest neighbors. We have a training set with positive class and negative class. So pretty easy to understand here. We've got our positive class in red and our negative class in blue. So at test time, when we get a new data point, we want to classify it. Now the intuition is that if the representation of this data is in some sort of smooth space where distance in the vector space somehow represents similarity, then we can merely look at the neighbors of our point we wish to classify. And we can say, hey, who's closest in this vector space to me? And maybe I should take a look at the things which are nearest and use those nearest things in a voting way to try to decide, hey, I'm going to be positive class or I'm going to be negative class. So nearest neighbors has a hyperparameter, k. We often talk about k nearest neighbors. So k is the number of nearby neighbors that I'm going to look at and vote with. So if I want to use three nearest neighbors, then I can go ahead and look for my test point and find the nearest neighbor. And then I will go ahead and find the second nearest neighbor. And then I will look around and find the third nearest neighbor. And among those three nearest neighbors for k equal to three, for a three nearest neighbors algorithm, I take the most likely to be the one that has the most votes. And in this case, that's going to be negative class. So the nearest neighbor algorithm is computationally very different than anything we've talked about so far. The entire learning process is merely to store the training set. That's it. Write it into memory, you're done. Now, in contrast to what we've been looking at so far, the prediction side when we have test time, it requires a lot more computation because what we've got to do is we've got to find all the nearest neighbors at test time. We don't know in advance whether or not, uh, whether or not, we don't know in advance who the nearest neighbor is. We just get a new test point somewhere in the vector space. So to find the nearest neighbors, we can't pre-compute that because there's an infinite number of possible vectors to look at, even for a rather small vector space, right? Real number lines, even one single variable has an infinite number of possibilities. So we can't pre-compute. We can only classify who's nearest at the moment of test. Okay, so that classification involves finding the nearest neighbors and then merely finding the majority vote. And that's why common values for the number k are odd. k equal to one, the nearest neighbor only, k equal to 3, find the three nearest neighbors, k equal to 5, right? 7, 9, because for odd numbers, there has to be a winner in the majority system, in a majority vote, okay? Even numbers of neighbors, obviously, we could have a tie and not know what the winning data class is. So this model is data-based. Because it's data-based, can pretty much overfit the crap out of everything, right? You can easily be looking at the noise and not the signal. It is also non-parametric. There's no assumption of linear decision boundaries here. There's no assumption of Gaussian distribution. The only assumption here is that things nearby in the vector space are more likely to be the same class than stuff that's far apart. So in contrast, other algorithms that we 
have talked about, no, uh, not in classification. In classification, our first parametric algorithm comes next time. All right, so let's say we have two classes like we were talking about there. Here is an example of a nearest neighbor classifier. As long as you are closest to this particular positive class point here, this has got to be positive class. And that's even true, even though this one positive class data point is surrounded by negative class data points. There's just a tiny little island of locations where you're going to call it positive class. So you can see right away how the nearest neighbor algorithm can make these very jagged, non-smooth, very complex decision boundaries, including fitting what's very likely noise if you, as ha if you have some assumption of, you know, like there's a true underlying process here plus some noise. This is probably little noise right over here. Okay. So regularization in nearest neighbors algorithm is upping the K. The more neighbors you're looking at, the smoother the decision boundary. You're essentially averaging out little bits of noise, like there's no longer a little island right around here. Because even though you might be right next to this positive class data point, the seven nearest things to that location are all negative class except for that one. Okay? So regularization is making K large. It smooths everything out. Think about what happens when you add even more. Right? You can get to a very smooth boundary where even like this relatively big island that existed here is gone in the 15 nearest neighbors. Okay. Think about what happens when K becomes the size of the data set. I'll let you think about that for a second. What happens? Yep, you're right. When K is the size of the data set, you just get a majority vote and every single data point gets labeled as the most common class. And there is no votes ever for anything else. Okay, so here's what a validation curve looks like for K nearest neighbors. Training set error always goes down even as the K value gets very, very big. Okay? Sorry, my bad. This is not K value here. <laughs> this is N over K. <laughs> this is the K value, right? So this is K equal to one, K equal to three, da, 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 da. So eh, important to realize that, right? So this is underfit. And then here we start to overfit as the validation set error goes back up. And training set error is always going down as K goes up. Model is more complex over here, less complex over here. This y-axis is flipped 180 degrees from the last validation curve we looked at. So most complex model with, uh, sorry, least complex model over here with k equal to 151, highly regularized, right? Most complex model over here with k equal to one. It is not flipped. I am needing more coffee, right? Less complex, more complex. k equal to 151 is highly regularized, underfit, overfit, okay? All right, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go back and re-record. So, nearest neighbors. Training super fast, because it's just store the data, but it's very slow at test time. Uh, it has one hyperparameter, k, that we've gotta choose, and increasing k is going to make us have a more regularized setup. That is, increasing K is part of the bias variance trade-off. And high K values reduce variance of fit 
every draw, every fit from the same process is going to look more similar. But increasing K increases the bias. It biases the model towards a simpler understanding of the data, right? Small Ks increase the variance. A new random sample for the training set from the same process might produce a very different decision boundary with small Ks. So there's variability in fit. And there's a reduction in bias because there's no forcing the thing to have a particular shape on the decision boundary. We're just going to fit the data. We don't care much. So we also have some issues because high dimensionality is going to screw us over. So when we have uh, a dimensional space, which is two or three, we only need a few samples possibly, like dozens or hundreds of samples. But however many samples we need in a low dimensional space, the number of samples we are going to require as dimensionality goes up scales to the power of the dimensionality. So it goes up not, um, it goes up by the order of n to, n to the power d. That's pretty fast. So training time fast, constant in time, testing time slow because at query time we've got to check with every single data point potentially and see which data point is closest. Right? That's why it's order n. Got to look at every single data point in the training set, see which one is closest. So how do we define closest? You can use any metric, right? Metrics we've already talked about. Metrics are defined by, you know, the same kinds of things that we define with norms in that, you know, distance of zero means that two things are the same. Uh, there's a symmetry to a metric that the distance from X to Y has got to be the same as the distance from Y to X. And then there's the triangle inequality once again, right? The Pythagorean theorem where going along the line from X to Y has got to be shorter distance than going from X to someplace else, Z, and going from Z to Y. And it's just the, exactly the Pythagorean theorem. There are so many metrics. All the vector norms work as metrics, as well as many other things that are not vector norms at all. So some of these are specialized, like the Hamming distance is made for looking at binary feature vectors, right? If your entire data set consists of on-offs, if it consists of I lay eggs or I don't lay eggs, I fly or I don't fly, then the Hamming distance is a good one to use. Okay, now uh, we have a problem where we like in ordinary least squares, we probably want to standardize variables. If we have one variable, which is orders of magnitude, bigger magnitude than another variable in the data set, the large valued variable is going to dominate all distance calculations, right? And so assuming that we care about smaller magnitude variables, we just care about variation within that small magnitude, then assuming that, that you do care about small magnitude variables, you should probably standardize each column separately. Z-score it. Take each column, Z-score it, turn it from its raw numbers into how many standard deviations a particular data point is away from the mean with regard to that variable. That way, every single variable has roughly the same order of magnitude. Now, for any particular metric we use, whether it's Euclidean or L1 or Hamming distance or whatever, however we are defining distance in this vector space. Well, then we can, if we choose, say some of these variables are more important for classification than others. This is something which is based upon domain expertise usually. 
right? I know that these variables here are more important than those variables there in determining whether somebody is a cancerous uh, disease haver or whether they are a healthy person. So we can weight those variables more strongly based on that. This is also potentially a hyperparameter that could be optimized through model selection, but that's asking a lot for most problems. Generally speaking, not done. Definitely a good way to overfit stuff, in my opinion. So if you have a principled reason to weight up some of the variables compared to the others, go for it. If not, probably leave this alone. All right. Lastly, just realize that anything that's order n is not a fun algorithm at scale, right? Remember that at test time, we have to look at every single sample in the training set in order to decide whether or not something is with us uh, in the closest realm. So that sucks. What if instead we could do something where we could limit our selection of the entire training set, mark it down to just a small subset. One way to do that is through KD trees. KD trees, what we do is we build a tree by starting with a particular data point. So we just pick any random data point in the training set. That's going to be our green root. Okay. We pick randomly one of the dimensions in the data set, one of the variables. And what we do is we branch out. We go, okay, what is the next nearest data point in the x direction? So I'm going to choose the x direction first. So this guy or that guy. All right, so we pick this one and that one. And from each one of these, we split again. And now we go in the opposite, in a different direction. So this time we were going X. The next time we're splitting five, four, we're going to go in Y. And so we go to this one and then that one. What we're doing by making this tree structure is very quickly, what we can do is eliminate half the data. If I've got a test point, right, that test point comes in somewhere, what I've got to do is ask myself, okay, let's start at the root of the tree. Okay. Am I less than the x coordinate or bigger than the x coordinate? If I'm bigger than the x coordinate, I go over here onto that part of the tree. If I'm less than the x coordinate of the green root, then I got to be over here. Okay, well, I've just eliminated half the tree. Okay, so um, because this test point is way over here, we've eliminated the entire right half. Okay, let's do that again. Where am I at? Am I above the y value of this purple point? Or am I below the y value of this purple point? Well, I'm above, so I've eliminated half the remaining tree. Well, that must be my nearest neighbor. So in a couple of quick decisions, I can mark down all the way towards the points that are in my neighborhood, either in this case, my nearest neighbor or a subtree where I have a collection of points that are all within my neighborhood. And then I can just calculate my distance to those limited subsets. Okay. Tree algorithms are pretty cool. You got to make one pass through the training data to build the tree. And then you have the tree to use at test time repeatedly to make your experience faster. So another method that can also be used is locally sensitive hashing. I'm not going to go into it actually. I don't have any questions on it in the assignments, but just know that this is another thing where normal hashing, if you've got a computer science background, is supposed to uniqueify numbers. It's the kind of thing you use for a checksum, right? For an error correcting code, if you've ever done that stuff. But locally sensitive hashing means 
things that are nearby in the vector space are going to get the same checksum. All right, if you don't know what that means, don't worry. But it's another way to limit yourself to only your nearest neighbors. So that's it. That's all I've got for you. Hope you had fun. See you in class. Bye.